trying to figure that out. I said, man, I can't fall out of here. Fall out on the stage. I want to start off by thanking everybody here at Songbird for making this thing happen, along with the uh, DC Abortion Fund and all that they're doing, their good, wonderful work. Also vital and important. And thank you all for being here as well. I want to remind everybody also, because some folks came after uh, we were all encouraged to, uh, to contribute. I know some folks came in after that. Yeah, so there's some barcodes out there on the table, please. Uh, at the last event they had in July, they raised a little over $1,000, and I think we can double that here and show them up. So I want to encourage everybody to, to please do them all. So I'm here to talk. Primarily the men, those of us who are male identified. That's my job here tonight. You know, we've been talking about voices, the choices. You know, as men, I can encourage you to donate. I can encourage us as men in our own personal lives to do the right thing. But where we fall short collectively as men, is how we encourage each other. You know, developing a voice is what I want to talk to the brothers here about. Uh, I met my sister, girlfriend, Emma G, probably about five, six years ago. I think I was here or in Atlanta. I was in one of those spots and she came. And it was uh, right around the height of Me Too movement. Uh, and we were doing some, a tour of events across the country. And again, the whole goal was to encourage men to develop a voice, to really speak out, you know, about not only what it means to be a man in regard to how we're getting tripped up all over the place, but really be in support of ending all forms of violence against women and girls. See, we know how to be good men in our own personal lives and just do the right thing in our lives and care for the people you know, uh, that we love and care for about. But to really get out front, develop a voice, spend time with each other, challenge each other with love, but be able to be in a conversation with each other around redefining what we call manhood is the, place, is the, is the area where we fall short. We don't have the language for it. We are actually the first generation of men being asked to speak out about healthy manhood. So for many of us, we don't have the language. And I'm encouraging us to find our voice in this space. Giving up some money and all that is good. We need to do that. That's all righteous. But the long-term goal, we're going to really ever put a dent in this thing called violence against women and girls. The collective body of men, the critical mass of men, have to be part of the solution. Right? We have to be part of the solution. So when you think about it, right, the large majority of men don't perpetrate violence against women and girls. I'm going to work off the assumption that we here collectively of men represent that group. It's a minority of men. It's a lot of men, but it's a minority of men in comparison to the rest of us. Right? We live in a society where men violence against women, right, and the issue of choice is a form of violence. Right? Where men's violence against women is at epidemic proportions. Right? So it's a lot of men, but it's a minority of men in comparison to the rest of us. Right? But the challenge is, the problem is, is that this minority of men get to perpetrate an epidemic of violence against women and girls, which also includes making decisions for what women and girls and other people can do with their bodies. That, in my estimation, is also a form of violence. It's the one that we're primarily addressing here today. But don't shortchange it, right? Uh, a choice also contributes, the, the lack of women having choice, the lack of people having choice also contributes. That socialization is the same socialization that fosters sexual violence, is the same socialization that fosters domestic violence, is the same socialization that forces inequality. It's all in there. It's not a siloed up deal, man. It's all together. 
back to us as men, a collective body of men, while the majority of us don't perpetrate violence, the problem is that we're silent to the violence. While the majority of us would never do the things that we know men do to horrendous things to women, while the majority of us don't do that, the truth of the matter is, the truth be told, how we collectively operate within the tenets of this thing we call manhood, how we collectively operate, really provides the fertile ground for men who perpetrate violence against women and girls to do it in our presence. Now, in our presence doesn't always mean that we were there when it happened. But in our presence does mean that it is happening on our watch, if we want to look at it that way. Right? How is it? It's a fair question for us to ask ourselves as men. How is it that a minority of men can create what we call an epidemic of violence against women and girls in the presence of all of us good men? How does that happen? It's a fair question for us to grapple with. It's a fair conversation for us to have with each other. But I, and again, we are the first generation of men being asked to develop a voice to speak about these issues. So I understand the challenges there. We're also the first generation of men even being held accountable for the violence that women experience at our hands. So there's, there's a level of newness to this, and I get it. I get that, but there's an urgency. There's an urgency of now that's in front of us. And so financially contributing, being a good guy myself, all of that's all of that's good. We need to do all of that. But we need a critical mass of men. Men thinking the way I'm talking. We need a critical mass of men to step up together in these spaces. Far too long we've been on the sidelines, operating in a mindset in which we've been taught that this is a woman's issue, that all of the issues I mentioned are women's issues. But you've heard folks here share tonight their human rights issue. I'm going to ask us to look at three aspects of manhood that contribute greatly to the violence that women experience at the hands of men. Right, and taking away the right for a woman to choose, we defining and deciding what women can do with their body, women and other people can do with their bodies, is a form of violence against women. There are three aspects of manhood that I want to ask we collectively as men to truly begin to examine in our lives and in the lives of men that we love and care about and begin to have some critical conversation. First aspect of manhood, how we're socialized collectively to have less value in women. And it's not whether we do it for the most part as men, it's when we do it and how it shows up. The second aspect of manhood, and, I'm, and let me be, let me say this also. What I'm sharing is, is not like an exact science. I'm not saying we all do it. But what I am saying is very much a part of what we come to know as manhood. It's very much a part of a male-dominated society. One, again, collectively we're taught to have less value in women, right? You, you can think about it in sports. The easiest way to tell a boy he's not playing up the part in sports is to tell him he's playing like who, a girl. Why does that work? What is it about that that makes it work? Right? Coaches don't mean no harm in many respects. Many times they're just trying to motivate, but it works. Right? My favorite question for coaches who tell boys to stop playing like a girl is to ask them, Coach, what are you saying about girls? And for us collectively as men, why does it work? Less value. The second aspect of manhood that I asked us to really critically think about is how we're taught that women are the property of men. Right? That women are the property of men. And that's why domestic violence flourishes in our society, unfortunately. 
And the third aspect of man that I would ask us to really begin to critically examine is women as objects, particularly sexual objects, which is why rape culture flourishes. Less value, property, plus objectification equals violence against women, right? Less value plus property plus objectification, if we made it an equation, and equal violence against women. And everything that we're talking about here today in a male-dominated society is wrapped up in that. And as I stand here as a male-identified person, it's not, and in, in deep in my socialization, it's in our DNA in some respects, it's almost innate because we're inundated with it at birth. It's not whether I ever practice less value, objectification, or property. It's more about, for me, when I know it's happening, what do I do about it? Do I put myself in check? Do I go in denial? Do I challenge myself? Do I work toward it happening less? I'm saying that to say that I can stand here on this stage and, and speak about this and at the same time say, you know, my mouth is not a prayer book. I'm on my own journey as a man. I'm on my own journey. It's nothing, it's not about perfection. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm on my own journey as a man. You can find many inconsistencies in my life. What I'm asking is that we collectively as men get on this journey together. Developing a voice, again, first generation of men being asked to speak out and promote healthy manhood from this particular standpoint of challenging the collective socialization that has created a fertile ground for an epidemic of men violence against women and girls. Men's violence against women and girls that has such epidemic proportions, they put it alongside a cancer and heart disease, which happen to be the number one and two causes of death for women in this country. That's how horrendous men's violence against women and girls is. When we leave here tonight as men, many of us would just leave out and call it. We will go take a walk home, whatever it is, not giving it much of a second thought. Women are constantly thinking about their safety. If it's three men that's gonna lock up this joint here tonight, they'll just lock the joint up. Maybe two of us might leave one here to let him finish off because we gotta run home to a game or something. Women don't do that. They leave together. They come together. They're always thinking about their safety and their love for us stops them. And, and, and it's, it's a default. It stops them far too often from, from telling us that they love us, they care for us, they live in community with us, and then they have to protect themselves from us all at the same time. And they don't talk about that with us. Not nearly enough to the point that the ones who do talk to us about it will find not you, not me, but we, we monsterize them. They love us. They care for us, they live in community with us, and then they have to protect themselves from us all at the same time. We can do better. We gotta figure this thing out. And part of it is not relying on female identified folks to engage with male identified folks on this issue. When I say not allowing, I'm not exiting them out of the equation. When I'm simply trying to say, let me say it better, we need to step up. It's our work to be with each other, to talk to each other. And I know it sounds like, it, yeah, just to brothers right here, right now, y'all here, y'all down, y'all listening, y'all in, into it. But if I were to ask you all to, when you leave here, everybody, Find 10 men and tell them about what we talked about. Stumble through it, that's okay. That's the journey. Every man here, take one of those 
little piece of paper with the codes on at home and take it to 10 friends and say, I want you to donate. It ain't like we gotta stop donating tonight. That's, that's the work. And I know you're thinking about what I'm saying right now. I know you are. And you're thinking about those 10 friends and you're saying, oh shit, I don't know if I want to do that. I'll do something, but I'm not sure I want to do that. Because the truth of the matter is we're talking about good men. We're not talking about men who perpetrate violence. Those are not your friends. I mean, we have some men like that in our families and we're attached to them by vir virtual blood, but for the most part, Though our friends are not in that group. But even then, the idea of doing that, you know, makes our heart go a little pitter patter. Brings up a little anxiety because it's not something that we're used to doing by and large as men. So we'll come here today, we'll participate, and we'll go home feeling good about ourselves and, and what we did. And, and you should. But the real work, man, is how we then go and engage other men. That's the work. Some of the sisters was talking about, that's the work that's going to make the change that we're looking for. And I'll say this as I close. Yes, we live in a society where there's an epidemic of violence against women and girls. It's one of the leading causes of injury to women and girls in this nation is men's violence. With that being said, I, I truly believe that women could end the violence, if female identified folks could end the violence on their own, they would have. That only makes sense to me. We can't depend on men who perpetrate the violence. And, and I'm not just taking, you know, over the dirty bath water and throwing them out. Some of them are men we love and care about. We would love them to get alongside of us. But we can't depend on them. Who's left from this equation, if we was going to call this an equation, who's left from it is us. Right? It's us. I truly believe that if we, as a collective body of men, a critical mass of men, join on with our sisters, we can make the change that's needed. But we've been on the sidelines far, far too long. And the collective socialization of man has really fosters that. It forces us on the sideline. It puts lead in our butts when we want to get up on our seats in and take a stance. It shuts down, zips up our mouth when we want to challenge something that we're hearing that we know is inappropriate. And we find comfortability in, well, I'm not doing it, so I'm okay. That's real and that's cool that you're not doing it, that I'm not doing it, but we're not okay. There's a collective liberation that we're seeking. Right? There's a collective humanity that we're seeking. You know, it's time for, for we as men to, to come to terms with the fact that, you know, I'm not free unless Emma G is free, right? We're not free unless women are free. We're not free unless we're really embracing a collective humanity that brings about freedom for us all. So, those voices, that ain't up there now, but those voices, Right, that we're talking about, those voices, developing a voice, developing a voice, and then beginning to speak out in a way. And, and we're not talking about hostility, we're not talking about confronting men. I hope you don't feel that's what's happening with me right now. We're talking about loving men through the process. We can have accountability and love in the same sense. It can work together hand in hand, we can do that. I hope you're feeling love for me, and I'm having a conversation that's rooted in accountability. All right? Love you all. Thank you for giving me a few minutes.